The Phoenix King is the title given to just one of the dual monarchy of the High Elves, a name that is given to an elected member of the High Elf Princes that touches a single piece of the greatness that is Assyrian, uh, becoming his kind of anointed servant on the world of Warhammer. Uh, you can kind of see that this is this is done uh, two different ways. The Ever Queen is is you know part of Aisha, and we look at the Phoenix King as a, 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 an anointed member, a kind not I don't want to say an incarnate, but the kind of uh, voice of Assyrian on Earth, quote unquote. And the rulership of High Elves is a pretty tumultuous one, though. I mean, Ulthuan itself is ruled over by princes and princesses from across noble families over all the inner and outer kingdoms of the realm. And these individuals then elect the next Phoenix King a year and a day after the last Phoenix King dies. And this is a nod to the uh, second uh, Phoenix King being elected after Anarian's disappearance slash death, you know, you know, whatever it is. Uh, they waited about a year and a day. And this is different from the Ever Queen, which, which is not elected, but is the firstborn daughter of the previous Ever Queen. And during the ritual marriage, that's there's a hyphen there, that occurs between the Ever Queen and the Phoenix King, they are to conceive the next daughter of Ulthuan, the next, the next Ever Queen. And that's really not here nor there, but I wanted to describe the process in case you guys were wondering about the juxtaposition between the two. The Ever Queen is the spiritual leader of Ulthuan, and there's for as long as there's been elves, there's been an Ever Queen. Um, uh, Astariel, the very first Ever Queen, is only the very first Ever Queen because it's the very first one that's been recorded. There were plenty more before her. And the Phoenix King is the leader of the uh, rest of the world. The rest of, it's the leader that the rest of the world interacts with, uh, as well as the, you know, the master of the Phoenix Court. So in this video, I want to talk about the many Phoenix Kings, starting briefly with Anarion, as we have kind of covered him in depth in previous videos, before moving on to his successor, Belshinar, all the way up to the current Phoenix King, Finobar the Seafarer. Now, this will be a two-part video. I was going to do it in a one-part video, but I just found that, okay, this is going to be pushing an hour on just the first six or so alone, so this deserves to be broken up into two, so the next one will be coming out early next week, so stay in time for that. So, um, the... Let, let's let's kind of hunker down and dive deep on the ages of rule for since the high elves have such long lives they mark their eras into individual reigns of each phoenix king uh the books call them historical epochs which i i love actually a really cool uh moniker for them and the example it uses in the book is uh the roman numeral 5 1439 which is the 90th day of the season of the sun, it's one of the four seasons, one being forest, two being rain, three being sun, four being storm, and in the 140th year of Caradriel, the peacemaker, the fifth phoenix king. So that's how you kind of get these, uh, how the, the elves kind of, I guess, create their calendar and how they really kind of mark each portion of the calendar because there's certain things that happen in individual reigns and it's kind of hard to have this, okay, year 543,000 because it's just they've been living for so long. They've not been living for 543,000. That's a little bit of a hyperbole on my part. I'm like a florist. But let's move on to our very first Phoenix King. So Anarian is the first of the Phoenix King, and easily the greatest as well as the most tragic of the High Elves, uh, really, if you kind of look at it in the whole. But to this day, people kind of still hearken back to the days of Anarion as an incredible time of wonder. You know, Anarion was originally this wanderer that traveled the vast majority of the world, learning a, a great deal from other civilizations. And at this time, the High Elves were, were mainly an agricultural society that was just getting into the practice of magic, which they mainly used to help grow things, you know, much like we see with the uh, Wood Elves. And that's actually the Wood Elves, as we'll talk about in a bit, when they kind of depart from High Elf society, they take a lot of things that are actually very true to the to the very roots of Elfdom and things that are very different to only specific to Wood Elves. But again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. But when Ulth One was beset on all sides by the demon hordes of the Great Catastrophe, Anarion returned to his people in the darkest moment. Stepping into the flame of Assyrian at the shrine of Assyrian, he became the anointed servant of the Creator God. Using the empower viewed within him, he slew the greater demon attacking the shrine and slaughtered the rest of the attending demons with that greater demon's very weapon. So, you know, just, just a lot going on there. And this action does two things. One, it sets up the future of all Phoenix Kings. They must pass through the flames of Assyrian unscathed to be deemed worthy to be a Phoenix King. And I'll spare you guys the end times bullshit until we get into the end times video about the elves, but basically 
the Phoenix King gets imbued with some super Assyrian Russian level steroids and comes out a glowy badass. Now, number two, Anarian and Kalidor Dragon Tamer began the great martial tradition that the High Elves so proudly kind of practice today, you know, uh, turning the entire populace into a militia of spearmen, archers, cavalry, and other disciplines of war. And the rest of the story goes as it always has, right? And I'll, I'll link to that story in the comments below. But Anarian takes up the Widowmaker after his wife, the Everqueen, is suspected killed. He, he thinks that she's been killed by a, a massive demon horde. And he brings up, he takes the Widowmaker to help him beat the demons. And Kalidor Dragon Tamer enacts a great ritual to create the vortex above the Isle of the Dead. And this heroic sacrifice is where we see the end of our hero as he kind of succumbs to the wounds of killing three and a half greater demons. I say half because Inkari just kind of gets pulled into the swirling miasma of the vortex and is trapped there. But, but, his actions save not just the High Elves, but the ritual that ends up saving the world for the demons that surround it. But next up is Belshinar. And Anarian had a son, uh, one we all know to be Malekith, and Malekith told the council that he deserves the title of Phoenix King, and it would honor his father, but he would also accept the council of nobles' decision and be supplicant to whoever they chose. Thus, Belshinar was elected, and Malekith was first to bend the knee. And this ultimately proved to be not good, but first, uh, Belshinar saw almost 2,000 years of peace, prosperity, and rampant growth. I mean, Belshinar the Explorer ruled from the year one, every single um, Phoenix King will have year one as their first year, to 1670. So he ruled for 1670. 1670 years and if you compare this to the imperial calendar that's uh minus 4419 it's it's like saying bce basically and uh uh minus uh, 4419 to minus 2749 but the elves numbers kind of restored to pre-great catastrophe and beyond their colonies had spread well into what would become the old world setting up in locations that would become bretonia marienburg and altdorf the elves spread across the globe you know maintaining a strong and important relationship with another elder race the dwarfs malekith the ambassador to the dwarfs had maintained and nurtured the vows of friendship that belshnar had personally sailed out to karazakarak to pledge and solidify but unfortunately, chaos had seeped its way back into the world in the form of cults of pleasure and excess throughout Ulthwan, you know, live sacrifices, orgies, non-stop cam girls, all over teenage elven boys' scrying devices. Things were getting out of control. And I, for one, would like to welcome our new savior, Selena. I mean, wait, <laughs> wait, what? Uh, so when Malekith returned from his ambassador duties... He returned to a nation that was extremely suspicious, and with his mother, Marathi, being the high priestess of a lot of these cults, Malekith denounced his own mother, kind of handing her over to the Phoenix King and hunted down a great deal of cultists, leading his own witch hunt of sorts. And finally, he convened a council of war at the Shrine of Assyrian, trying to kind of convince them that Belshinar was a member of one of the cults. At the same time, he had the Phoenix King poisoned, so he couldn't even argue these points. He was immediately kind of snuffed out of history. And as the council refuted this claim, they were all slaughtered, because a lot of the council knew Belshinar from, for, for many, many, many a year. And they were saying, there's, there's no way he would be into something like this. You're, you're completely full of shit, Malekith. But Malekith went to ascend to the flame of Assyrian, and was instead turned into the Darth Vader of the Warhammer world, burned from head to toe in magic divine flames. And Assyrian surely had the high ground, and thus, Ulthwan was thrown into chaos once more. The man to inherit this chaos was Emric, or, or we know him as Kalidor I, or later, Kalidor the Conqueror. And the land was really in uh, great upheaval, right? Malekith had killed off a huge majority of the ruling portion of Ulthwan uh, before retreating to his ancestral home of Nagarith. And we've talked about this a little bit when we've talked about uh, Anarian itself, but Anar or, um, Nagarith is the home of Anarian during Anarian's reign. And Malekith inherits that as pretty much, you know, this is his ruling land. He is the noble of, of Nagarith. And Nagarith is, of course, where we, where we get what becomes the Dark Elves, right? This is this land that has kind of been twisted by Anarian's latter portions of his rule, where the Widowmaker has kind of turned him darker and colder and more sinister. But in doing so, you have... The beginning of what we now know as the Sundering. And Kalidor was immediately locked in a brutal civil war with Malekith, you know, fighting to maintain not only his title as Phoenix King, but the sanctity of Ulthwan itself. 
And the schism had become where elf became dark and high, right? Before this, we just have elves, but this is where you get dark and high elves. And Malachus Kin making dark packs with evil magic as they desperately fought against their, well, high elf brothers of Ulthwan. And eventually this conflict boiled down to Malekith planning to break open the Great Vortex, sending chaos whirling back into the world. And as they enacted their dark ritual, and we, we saw this actually in Total War Warhammer, it displays the exact like energy burst back and forth, the energy they set forth to unravel the Vortex rebounded. The trapped images, the, not images, the trapped mages of the original ritual deflected the magic back towards Nagarite. And just full court press packed the shit out of that ball. And Nagarith, Nagarith is then consumed by you know, horrible floods and thousand foot tall waves crashing inland, destroying everything. You know, coupled with massive earthquakes, the grim land of Nagarith and neighboring, neighboring Tiranach for that matter, was in ruins. And the Dark Elves fled to what, uh, they fled to Nagron far to the north, you know, taking their, their kind of doomed cities with them by some fell magic. And what followed was a century of rebuilding. Calderon knew he had to strengthen the inner and outer kingdoms against the Dark Elves. So he built all the massive fortress gates that protected the passageways to the heartland of Ulthwan. You know, the Griffin Gate, the Phoenix Gate, Eagle, Dragon, and Unicorn Gates. And when the conflicts arose with the Dark Elves once more, it was over the Blighted Isle where the Sword of Cain resided. And Calador led expedition after expedition against the Dark Elves, capturing the Blighted Isle of, of the High Elves or I'm sorry, for the High Elves. And this, you know, solidifies his title, Calador the Conqueror. And there's this cool moment in the book where it talks about the sword tempting Calador, and he kind of just simply refuses, just kind of looks at it and says no. And this sort of Aragon-esque move where he realizes he will not fall to the sins of his forefathers, it, it's pretty awesome. And as the fleet returned from their campaign, a, a freak storm separates Calador's ship from the rest of the High Elves. And it was then beset by Dark Elf Corsairs. And Calador and his men, you know, fought off multiple boarding parties. But at the last, Calador tossed himself into the sea, clad in full armor. And the book outright says it was a bad end for a great king. And that's true. Calador kept the High Elves united together during one of the darkest moments of its history. You know, establishing the gate system that was also integral in helping combat further incursions by both Malekith and his demon allies. I mean, even though these early kings are more about the treachery of Malekith and the history of the High Elves, Calador definitely had the foresight of his people in mind. And you can really see a trend here. We're on the third Phoenix King, and they're all somewhat martially involved in things. Belshinar not as much. He was definitely uh, kind of thrown to the wolves there and killed outright. But Calador and Anarion were both very um, uh, militaristic, at least. And our next uh, Phoenix King is kind of going to be kind of a, a not so much that, but you will see. That's Calador the second. Oh, God. So Calador the first had left his successor, Calador the second, Calador the warrior, with the strongest navy in the world and a, and a large army and a powerful line of fortresses that dotted the northern landscape, you know, most of all in Nagarith and Kothic. I'm sorry, uh, Nagarith and Trace. So Calador the second rules from one to 600, and that's IC... Uh, minus 2198 to minus 1599. And he is, of course, the fourth Phoenix King. Really, the elven people were looking to hopefully continue the legacy that was Calor the First. Uh, that's what the nobles kind of said, like, hey, we're going to elect his son because if his dad is so awesome, his son's got to be pretty damn good too, right? Unfortunately, Calor's son was rash, impetuous, and foolish. You know, traits his father had none of. And still, trade flourished during this time. The elves expanded out to the old world once more, you know, establishing trade routes with the dwarfs and solidifying bonds with them. And cities such as Torlesi and modern-day Bretonia flourished under the massive influx of trade and in and out of the port city. But no Phoenix king can go without the uh, congenital herpes that is Malekith the Witch King. And Malekith knew of the trade routes that the dwarves used and it ambushed a number of traveling merchants, leaving evidence behind to make it look like the High Elves were behind the attack, like they had left uniforms from High Elves and banners and stuff like that. Uh, they'd use, um, not shod, I'm thinking of uh, uh, arrows that looked like they were from the High Elf kingdoms. So High King Gotrek Starbreaker demanded recompense for the issue, to which Kalidor responded pompously, saying that the Phoenix King responds to does not respond to please, or I'm sorry, he responds to please, not demands. 
And Gotrek gets pissed at this and, and demands double, saying he makes no pleas to gods or men. And Kalidor responds by shaving the dwarf ambassador's beard. And wha-bam! The War of the Beard begins. Now, we all know me. And we know that I would side with the High Elves over everything. Even in the War of the Beard video we did documenting the entirety of that conflict, I sided with the Elves. But I'll break character to tell you. Kalidor II was an absolute Ponzi hairdresser, a foppish dick the Elves hath not seen since or will see. I genuinely hate Kalidor II because he causes the downfall, downfall of the entire High Elf civilization. This conflict drains both race, races so much that they lose their footing across all of their more wayward expansions. And we, we go into this whole entire uh, huge, awesome fight in the War of the Beer video, which again will be linked after this, but I'm trying to just focus on Kalidor II's life itself. So, the High Elves were astonished, right, at the perseverance of the Dwarfs. But likewise, the Dwarfs were amazed at how disciplined and coordinated the Elves fought. Uh, if, up to this point, uh, the Dwarfs had just been used to seeing Elves either in colonies, which were for the most part not martial. They were extremely uh, low-key. They were very uh, agricultural. They were very, you know, they were, they were bringing peace. They were just having a bunch of sex in foreign lands. And the dwarfs were, or the high elves for that matter, were not used to anything dwarf military based. So to see both their militaries come to the fore was, was astonishing for both of them. The elves were not aware of how willing to fight to the last man the dwarfs were. And the dwarfs were not aware that the elves fought in these beautiful disciplined ranks with these knights that had all sorts of like different variations. So they were not prepared for that. And that's why this, this fight went on for so long. Calder the second upset with how long the war had been taking. Uh, remember, I mean, it's been multiple, multiple centuries at this point, decides to lead the defense of the 14th siege of Torlesi. A lot of people want to go back and forth about, oh yeah, the dwarfs totally kicked the high elves asses. Yeah, well, it took you 14 times to siege one city and you still didn't even break it. Ha! But the result is a personal battle between High King Gotrik and Calador II. And Calador II loses after, loses after a multiple day fight with Gotrek, uh, taking the Phoenix count, their Phoenix crown as uh, payment for the transgressions against his people. So I, I'll give the, I'll, I'll bow the Phoenix crown there. Yeah, the 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 dwarfs definitely won that one. <laughs> but thus passes a bad king, in a great way, you know, kind of an epic way. Conversely, to his father, which brings us into our fifth Phoenix king, Caradriel the Peacemaker, who ruled from one to six hundred and four, nice six hundred and four years of reign. And this is the imperial calendar of minus 1599 to 996. So just coming up onto the life, lifespan of uh, Sigmar here. So you'll find that most of the Phoenix Kings, well, the earliest ones at least, inherit their title in the midst of, or at the head of, a major conflict for the High Elves. And such was the same for Caradriel, a prince of Ivris, a man who was the polar opposite of Kalidor II, you know, calm, collected, and indifferent for the most part. And he was a capable ruler and a really sound soldier. And that's pretty common of Ivris as these very kind of indifferent, very stoic individuals. But at the heels of the defeat against the dwarfs, Malekith made his move as the two races had unwittingly played into his grand schemes. Moving south from the Blighted Isle, the Dark Elves captured Tor Anlek in Nagarith and used it as a staging point through the northern outer kingdoms besieging the Griffin Gate. With the two very powerful foes and two very different fronts before him, Radriel enacted his first decree. The abandoning of the elven colonies and the reconciliation of troops back to the elf heartland, reforging a new phoenix crown and recalling the armies, uh, Kradriel made to strengthen Ulthuan against her fallen kin. And sometimes the word kin reminds me of a uh, hot dog skin. I don't know why, but... Uh, you guys needed to know that because when I think of Malachus' burned body, I think of a hot dog without its casing. Just food for thought. Now, moving on, a lot of the more, <laughs> Jesus Christ, overzealous High Elves did not react kindly to this. They thought it an insult to reforge the crown and abandon the fight against the dwarves. Also, Elf colonists felt that this was an act of betrayal to recall and leave everything they'd done so far. I mean, you have to think, of, remember this, the elves were on the precipice of planning a massive invasion of Karazakarak. Like they, that's where they were going. <laughs> they weren't. Uh, they weren't like, oh, okay. Well, we just lost that one. Well, let's just let's just take it on the cheek. Before Kradriel had been anointed, 
that was the plan. Like, all right, well, we're going to go siege their capital and, and hand some ass. But uh, there's a reason that place is called the uh, the Unbreakable City or the Unsiegeable City or whatever it's called. I can't remember off the top of my head, but still. To the Zealots, Zealots, Kradriel responded that he'd rather lose the crown than the realm. And to the colonists, he told them that if elves required the protection of the armies of Ulthuan, then they should return home, where those armies could best offer that protection. So Kradriel was an elf that gave little fucks and doled out the verbal justice that the otherwise haughty race needed to hear in times like this. His actions spurred the genesis of the colonists of Athaloren, becoming the Wood Elves as their traditions separated from that of the other High Elf cultures. Now, what was left was the defense of Ulthuan which Karadja left in the hands of far more brilliant field commanders than himself. He knew his shortcomings, and he knew that while he was a good individual fighter, he was not a leader nor a general. And this is the first time we see a Phoenix King assume more of a diplomatic and less of a martial role in the High Elf society. He, he outright said, you know, I'm not suited for this. I'm going to leave I'm gonna leave this suited, uh, suited to men that are more appropriate for the task. Tethlas of Kalidor, of the appointed field commanders, broke the siege of Griffin Gate, and push the Dark Elves back to within sight of Torianlek. You know, in, in, um, empowered, I guess you could say, by Caradriel. Now, with the war governed by better minds, Caradriel took to seeing the logistics of bringing his people back from abroad. Strengthening the other gates, he is the Phoenix King that instated rotations on each of the gates, ensuring that they were always garrisoned, that they were always garrisoned by fresh troops. And with their northern border secured, the High Elves held the line. You know, the centuries of hate that the Dark Elves had were really blunted against the disciplined ranks of the Phoenix King soldiers. Moreover, because most of them were veterans of the War of the Beard and faced far more persistent foes than the Dark Elves. And while the Dark Elves were not fully defeated, they were abated, not masturbated, they were abated. And Karadriel died peacefully in his bed, and he was the first Phoenix King to do so. And with Karadriel's passing, the council chose Tethlas of Kalidor to succeed him. A worthy option is he was the hero of the Griffin Gate and a very competent leader. You know, he had one of, he really, he really had one purpose as Phoenix King. That was restore Ulthuan entirely to the hands of the High Elves, pushing the Dark Elves off the island completely, recapturing the Blighted Isle in the process. So he's our sixth Phoenix King, and he's named Tethlis the Slayer. And he really only lives from, well, his reign is 1 to 306, and that's IC uh, minus 996 to minus 691. But Tethlis was much like Anarian in that he fought with a very bitter and cold hatred for his foe. The Dark Elves had slain his family in one of their many raids, so he kind of exacted his... Uh, vengeance and cold fury that matched his darker kin. And, and this is really, again, very similar to Anarion, you know, that kind of fight fire with fire, so to say. And with this came the training of every one of the elven cities. They were required to have mustering fields where their men could train almost painstakingly. And the result was an army that had been likened to the strength and discipline of that of Anarion's silver host in the ages long past. And part of what made Tethlis so great as a military mind was that he never committed to any engagement he couldn't bring overwhelming force to, creating victory after victory for the High Elves. And through this attrition, he wore the Dark Elves down, keeping High Elf casualties to a minimum. To a minimum. And they pushed the Dark Elves completely off of the Shadowlands, stormed Tor Anlek, and razed the entire city to the ground, You know, giving them the old Carthage treatment from ancient Rome, put some salt in that bitch. And shortly after... The greatest armada the elves had ever known was gathered to retake the Blighted Isle in a massive undertaking known as the Battle of the Waves. And the elves fought in this bloody battle across the land, you know, turning the sea crimson with their blood. And the high elves eventually won, butchering the dark elves to a man in an act that made the high elf nobles afraid that their men would really get a taste for the barbarism that they were inflicting. You know, they were saying like, hey, 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 stop killing everyone. I, I know, I know Tefla says to, but don't do it because we know how the elves are prone to fall to you know their emotional whims more or less i mean let's let's not like not beat around the bush as much as i am want to say it um the elves uh are a very emotional people and they they'd always kind of fall to that is what makes them kind of so um susceptible to slanesh in a lot in a lot of ways but as Tethlis moved across the Plain of Bone, he noticed a glint in the dirt, you know, investigating, he eventually unearthed the dragon armor of Anarion, which he gifted to Aurelian, the great-grandson of Morleon, Anarion's son, 
with the Everqueen. I swear they all have Ian at the end of their name, I-O-N, and that's just that's a doozy to say. But shortly after that, after uh, the after he kind of comes to the Shrine of Cain, where the Widowmaker resided, we see the end of our Phoenix King. And there are two stories. One is that an assassin ambushed him when he was meditating over the sword. The other is that when he went to withdrew, withdraw the sword, his bodyguard cut him down. And I'm going to assume it was the former, as the High Elves are not prone to hurting their own. It's a pretty unspeakable sin. Well, I mean, like, sundering withstanding, of course, but the, the to have a lot of intrigue in court and to do stuff behind others' backs, that's fine. In fact, it's like the spice of life for when it comes to High Elves. But you never go as far as to kill someone, like a, a, your own kin. Again, High Elves, Dark Elves aside. But that brings an end to Tethless and the end to this video. We have about three or four more kings to go through. We have um, Belcor Hadris, Aethys, uh, Mor Morvael, Belhathor, and then lastly, Finubar. He's the seafarer. He's our he's our uh, sixth king here. So, no, oh, I'm sorry, the eleventh king. God, I just can't count Roman numerals sometimes. But he'll we'll cover them in another video here to come out in a couple days. Um, this is a, quite a bit to take in all at once. So I wanted to make sure that this was uh, easily digestible across two videos here. But if you do have any questions about some of these kings or maybe some actions that happened during their reign, let me know. Uh, the eighth edition High Elf book does cover pretty much all the major events that happen while each king is kind of in um, in power. You know, key events in High Elf history, it even says right in the book, you know, you've got Battle of the Isle of Dread, Malachus Betrayal, Nagarites Rise, Sundering, War of the Beard, blah, 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 blah. Like all these kind of massive happenings that go on with each one of these rules and these age of rule, as it were, when it comes to uh, the individual king's ruling. But hopefully this gives you a better idea of not only the timeline of the Warhammer world, but of the High Elves as a whole. You know, it kind of feels like when you talk about High Elves, you've got Malekith, or you've got Anarian, then you've got the whole Malekith Sundering situation, then you've got the whole War of the Beard situation, and it just, you kind of get lost in the timeline here. So hopefully this can help put things into perspective for you guys. But as always, thanks so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, check out my Patreon, all that kind of action. But have a good one, and take care.